And uh, today we have a super special treat. We have super athlete Kate Courtney joining us. She is, I call her a champ champ, uh, uh, world champ 2018 and 19. She is the best US female in mountain biking uh, in the past 20 years. So she's kind of a big deal, but uh, truly I just think she's an awesome, wonderful human being. So super stoked to have her uh, with me today so we can talk about uh, literally everything uh, from uh, girly stuff to uh, being a complete badass. So with no further ado, here she is. Uh, hi, Kate. <laughs> hi. Thank you for the introduction. I hope I didn't mess up your statistic. Oh, close enough. It's all. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> it's awesome to be able to uh, be on live with you. This is as close as we can get these days. I know. <laughs> We've known, how long have we known each other? Because, like, from, um, yeah, Red Bull, we did the pub camp, but we did a few Red Bull things yeah. like a really long time ago. Yeah, I feel like I've known you, I think 2016 might be when I met you. Does it, would that make sense? It might have been 2017. Was 2017 the year you got second at World after you got a flat on your tire? It is. <laughs> Amazing memory. Yeah, I oh, do. Oh my god. I Incredible do. Incredible memory. <laughs> this is a I don't think my mom even remembers that. <laughs> this is a scary thing about me. I I'm like a, a goldfish at first. Like you'll tell me something, I'll forget it five minutes later, but then I remember like everything. <laughs> And I just, I just remember that story, I think, from you, because it, that really impressed me. Like, it wasn't, I think, that type of, um, you know, having something so out of your control happening and being able to stand back up and, and give your best, that to me is so much more impressive than having, like, you know, an, an easy ride when everything goes well and you do finish first. I think that sometimes as an athlete, um, those are the type of events that really take you from a certain mental state and be able to be a certain way as an athlete and just really push you to that um, next level. I don't know if that was like that for you. Um, but no, that I mean, and I remember talking to you about it and your perspective on that is something that I always really respect and I think shows what a competitor you are is that mm. you've won at that level and you've also, you know, come close and failed and tried. Mm -hmm. and, and I think those experiences as athletes are the ones that stick out in our memory. Um, and I think it's it's a good thing to bring up right now because <laughs> yeah. you know, that story, I was my last year under 23. I you know, finished second, but on a day when I felt I could have won mm -hmm. if I hadn't crashed in the first five, I made it 500 meters. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> like literally three seconds into the race, I'm like on the ground in last place. Oh my God, uh, I've been there. <laughs> But I thought that was, you know, my last chance to win the rainbow jersey is what you win mm -hmm. in mountain biking yeah. if you're a world champion uh, for a while. Because I was moving up to the elite category and I thought, okay, it might be possible someday, but it's going to be a really long time. Yeah. Uh, and maybe never, you know. Yeah. yeah. There's no guarantees. Yeah. Um, so that was a, a tough loss. But in, you know, true, like, storybook fashion, I actually won the elite title the next year. Yeah. So... It's one of those things you in sport just have to be kind of like almost a psychopathically relentless optimist <laughs> yeah. and just think that each thing is setting you up to be a yeah. better athlete and a better version of yourself and to be able to fight for that second place taught me a lot of skills that, you know, have helped me win mm -hmm. other races or to be positive and, uh, you know, salvage a good result on a day yeah. that could have been a, a not finishing. <laughs> yeah, you brought something that resonates so much with me is like the, the psy psychotic way of being positive. And I feel like I've always been like that. It's like you need to have something uh, deep down in your heart that is filled with belief that is just completely insane. But somehow <laughs> that belief just helped you keep showing up. And it's like your heart is full of that like fire and belief and you keep showing up and you keep falling on your face and it's almost as long as you believe it could happen. Yeah. And it's really interesting you say that. I think 
you know, a lot of people, you and I both have this energy and I think that's why we're drawn to each other Yeah, uh, and are some somewhat positive people, I would say. Yeah. Um, but it, it's a deeper sense of optimism. Mm -hmm. I think it's not yes. waking up every day with this kind of, you know, rosy glasses on. Oh, everything's great. I think there's actually a lot more ups and downs when you're yes. chasing a dream like this. Uh, but it's that deep belief that, okay, today might suck, but I'm going to mm -hmm. do this work because I have this deeper belief that this might be possible and I can manifest that by continuing to show up. <laughs> I, I agree a hundred percent. I think I'm very positive and I, I try to be as happy as I can, but truly inside, I feel like I'm a, you know, I, I, could maybe murder someone when I train, <laughs> you know, it's so like, because that desperation of becoming the best you, it, it, it can be very aggressive and driven and like comes with discipline. Um, but I think like the, the positive and happy comes from knowing you've done your best because let's, let's not fool anyone. Like I, I've seen you compete and I've seen your face and we've trained together and I've seen your, your eyes when you train and it goes to that very, very dark place, which is not necessarily filled with positive, but it's <laughs> filled with that belief to, you know, get yourself to that next step. Yeah. It's definitely, I think we all have kind of these like double yeah. personalities <laughs> in a way. I think for me, um, I have it on my vision board. I had to remake my vision board, which you'll appreciate. Yeah. It's called the 2020.2 vision board. <laughs> Cause Cause the first version maybe isn't so possible yes. anymore. Um, but I have part of it is like, it's almost a split of mm -hmm. there's the warrior side and the sparkle yes. side, yes. which for me, the sparkle is the connection, the positive, yes. the joy of riding my bike and, mm -hmm. you know, meeting athletes like you. And it's, yeah. it's fun. What we do is really fun yes. in a lot of ways. But then there's this warrior side that is the kind of internal voice and drive yes. and belief um, that is a deeper and, and less kind of fun sparkly side. Yeah, but they really balance each other well when you're trying to become the best you. Because if you only stay on the sparkly connection side, I, I've noticed for myself, if I go too far on that side, I become a little bit too, like, I'll feel bad if I beat someone <laughs> in a workout type of deal. Because that connection side is so important. And we compete with a lot of our friends. So you need that warrior side to keep you on to really like be that, you know, hard competitor that you can be. So I do think the balance yeah. between both is, is super important. I don't know if you've ever found yourself too far on one side. Yeah, I feel like for me, like the, the sparkle side is involving other people. Yeah. And the word side is almost like, there could be no competitors. It's yes. about like, that yes. deep voice of like pushing myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that yeah, if, if I go too far on the kind of connection, outreach, inspiring other people, coaching other people, like too much time is spent on that and not enough on thinking about, you know, my own drive yes. and being in my body, on my bike, focus on my sport, um, I get distracted. Yes. But, you know, luckily, I think partially because my training a lot of the time is alone and, and difficult. Yeah. I, I find that warrior voice when I do like hill yeah. repeats alone. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it's it's harder than other times to find it. But I think it's, mm -hmm. you know, both are always there. I, c I couldn't agree more. I think having a, a well balanced to become the best you also goes with. It's really hard to find. I call them my inner uh, demons. It's hard to find them when you're always surrounded with other people. And it's nice yeah. to go on this alone suffering journey because when you face them, it's really just you with them. And the question is, as no one is watching, as it might be raining, as it might be dark outside, how, how do you react? How do you face this really lonely challenge? What, what are the voice saying? And that has always been to me so helpful in uh, building awareness. And it's really hard to do that when you're surrounded with other people that tell you, oh, it's okay, it's okay. And you're like, no, I kind of gave in, it's not okay. But it's yeah. hard if you're with people. 
I agree. Yeah, I, I really do think that that kind of solo suffering is important mm -hmm. in our sports. And for me, it's always like those hill repeat days. And the first one's really hard. And I have this voice in my head. And, and you always, I, for me, at least, I always have these breakthroughs. And I feel like I can hear that voice mm -hmm. the clearest. Um, and sometimes you surprise yourself, like, oh, yeah. you know, do this really hard workout. I don't think I can finish it. And I finish it. And then I say, I wonder if I could do this. I wonder if I could keep going. Or I wonder if I could, like, do this power next time. Yeah. And that voice is, like, always very... It, you know, it's not thinking, it's just kind of like the automatic response. Mm -hmm. And that's when I'm like, that, that's me. That's yeah. me trying to push. And I and feel like um, you, you brought up such a good point right now. Like to me, what you just said is, is a huge difference with someone who can be good and someone who can be great. And it's this huge interest and curiosity about what you can do. It's being curious, wanting to learn, wanting you're like, okay, my body can do this. And all of a sudden your mindset switched to, can I? <laughs> Instead of, I think most people, it's like, this is what's on paper and they'll just do this and the bare minimum. And I think like the, the difference between being good to great is this curiosity of really wanting to know how far you can push and when you're gonna break. And uh, I'm sure you've surprised yourself a, a million times doing that. And it's, I think, is the best feeling when you, you, you get through that little wall that you created and get to that next step. Yeah. And it's, it can be something small. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, we've been talking about um, training as if it's normal right now, but <laughs> it's, not, it's not normal right yeah. now. You know, for me, Olympics were just canceled. My race season is totally undefined. Uh, and we're kind of easing back into interval training and, and mm -hmm. you know, trying to basically do base training right now, I think, yeah. is what most athletes are doing um, so that you maintain fitness, but you can put the pedal to the floor when, when we find out a date. Um, but for me this week, it's really been sometimes turning off that voice and just yeah. saying, okay, you know, just getting through the workout and that might be a huge breakthrough. Yeah. Uh, you know, at the start, having all this anxiety or not being able to like really feel good on your bike and yeah. then having breakthrough and being able to do it it's even those moments mean a lot to me even if it's not like my biggest uh day on the bike or my record or my best race like those little kind of moments of surprising yourself and making progress yeah. I think are really just as important yes any progress right any <laughs> No matter what it looks like, progress is, is, is the key here. Um, I wanted to, you to explain to people at home that might not know really um, like what it is that your sport is. Because I think, I think that even the qualification process to, to the whole thing is pretty insane. And then I want to dive deeper in uh, the Olympic situation. Because I don't think people really understand that you guys you know, I think you've died for eight years <laughs> to try yeah. to to get your spot for the Olympic. And, and now it's something that is, is very unsure. And uh, for, for the athlete, it's not only a dream, but it's kind of your whole financial situation. You're, so it's just so much sacrifice to be in an unknown situation. So tell us, uh, like, what does a, a Kate Courtney race look like? Like, what, okay. what is yeah. it? So cross-country mountain biking is an Olympic sport. It's been in the Olympics since 1996. Um, and it actually was big first in America, but now is mainly kind of a very popular sport in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, but the races, they're a mass start race. So we all start on the line. It's usually in a World Cup, about 80 women. Uh, they Actually, now they're doing lights. It's like Formula One, but they That's used awesome. to do a whistle. <laughs> uh, to start, we all go and it'll be a lap of a usually five kilometer course. Um, and we typically do five or six laps depending on how long the course is. Um, so it's a lot of single track, uphill, downhill, there'll be rock drops and rock gardens and fun features, um, as well as those steep climbs. And the race lasts about an hour and a half. First woman back across the line wins. Okay, but I want to I want to go back to also how how you qualify to know where you're going to be on the starting line because that to me is is so 
um, unusual because the, the, the time domain is almost the opposite of when you do the full race? So the, yeah, to get the start spot for the World Cup, and this is new, um, and they actually do a race on Friday night, the night before, where it's uh, a short track race. So yeah. it'll be like a 20 minute race. Again, mass start, 40 women in these races, and you compete for the front spot on the row. It's pretty cool. Pretty fast and curious. <laughs> I mean, if you guys at home I have, have never like watched the, those type of race, like please like Google it right now or maybe <laughs> after uh, our interview. But it, it's it's just I'm blown away because I mean you're you're like all cute and and uh, you're just <laughs> such a badass too. <laughs> Like Kate, oh, like <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> but you, you see Kate going, and it's like she literally always finished with most of the time mud from head to toes, and uh, just like do those those insane like there's always those insane rock feature that they have to drop, and it it seems to be so technical, but also so steep and kind of so everything, and. Uh, I think it's it's very impressive, and uh, I also want to talk about that other side of. Uh, I I love you all for of your that. Person that biking. I feel it's the same way. Like that's what drew me to the sport is, it is so physical. It's an endurance mm -hmm. sport, but it's so fun. There's yeah different types of challenges. It's mentally really challenging. Tactically, you have to be really smart mm -hmm. in the races. Technically, it's super physical getting down those rock gardens. Um, but it, again, still has all of the elements of an individual endurance sport, like marathon running yeah, yeah. with all the extra fun stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you guys get to practice on the track before you compete, right? We do. Yeah. Like, like how far ahead? And is that something that everyone really have access to? Or is that something you were able to get more access to it as you, you got kind of higher on the ladder with, you know, sponsor and teams and that type of deal? Yeah, it's luckily everyone gets the same access. So okay. the World Cup week um, will go kind of a week early. They're usually in Europe. And then we can ride the course all week. And then we race Friday and Sunday. So you do get a good amount of practice time. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's not only like physically and mentally to get the course dialed in, but also there's a lot of equipment choices. So tire pressure, mm. what tires you run. Um, and that's something that we spend a lot of time on. That's crazy. It's like so much thing that you need to control because there's so much you can control on the on the yeah. race and the uh, the tr the track. I don't know how you call it. Is that a track? How do you call it? track course. It's the course, the course. It. Okay. <laughs> Let's go with the course. The track counts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So going back to the Olympics, I want to go back uh, to 2016. How, how close were you? Uh, back in 2016 to, to get a spot for the Olympic? Yeah, so it was pretty close. Um, in mountain biking, we've only ever had two spots okay. until this Olympics. Uh, and we'll actually earn three for nice. Tokyo, uh, which we could get into. But it it was two in 2016. Um, and I was 20 at the time. Okay. So I was still racing under 23 in that category. Mm, yeah. Um, so it's it's a bit of a tricky qualification process because I wasn't racing head to head with the elite women. Mm. So I was winning under 23 races, but not racing in the elite field. Um, so it, it came down to a discretionary pick, which means that a committee sits and meets and decides. And it was basically three women competing for one spot. Um, cause one of them had already been solidified. So yeah. it, it was close and definitely, uh, like a wait up at midnight refreshing oh, man. its experience. Um, but it also for me at that time, like I would have gone as a metal potential athlete, which means that, you know, in 2020, they would see me as metal capable, mm. but I was not at that time there fast yet. enough to really earn the spot. Gotcha. So I gotcha. think for me, like it, it, at the time, of course, it seemed like it would have been such a cool thing, but I actually think it was kind of the best thing that could have happened because yeah. in 2016, I would have gone to like get the Nike swag and walk around the village and yeah. participate in the race. I wouldn't have yes. gone to win a medal. Yes. Um, and I remember saying that night when I like was refreshing the page, I said in 2020, like 
I am not doing this. I'm going to qualify early. Like there's going to be no question of whether I'm going yeah. or not. I'm, I'm going to meet the selection criteria and I'm going to focus on the race instead of in 2016. Like I haven't thought about the race at all. I yeah. know like yeah, yeah, yeah. it was going to this event. It, it wasn't a race for me. Whereas, yeah. you know, my 2020 preparation, it's been about the course, the climate, the like specific things that I can do to be successful in this race. Mm. Um, not just to focus on like having the kind of glory to go. Yeah, I I totally get you on that. Um, <laughs> I, I I'm I have the same mindset for that. Where uh, like for me, even competing in CrossFit, a, a big thing that my husband knows is that as soon as I wasn't in contention necessarily of winning, I just I I just don't know why I would go. <laughs> <Like>, <laughs> Like, because I don't want to, like, for me, it was important to, to go and compete and not to go and just, you know, hope to do your, your best and, and like, just feel like you're participating. And, um, I mean, that, that competition can, can look like different things. Cause definitely my, my last year was coming back from a shoulder surgery and, I, I knew I was, wasn't going to win, but for me, I was going to compete to be the best version of me, um, which I did accomplish on that year. And that's when I literally came back home and I was like, I'm done. Like, I'm good. I, I became who I wanted to become and like, I, I'm good with that. But I really do understand that I don't think I would have the mindset to go just to participate, to say that I'm there. Like I want to yeah. compete and have a shot at fighting because I think the the fight in the competition is is the beauty of it. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's what twenty twenty has yeah. been, you know, the focus for me. And I think also like that was really a turning point in my career. In twenty seventeen, the entire year I never placed below second in a race. Yeah. I won nationals. Like it. If the Olympics had been in 2017, I would have hands down gone, you yeah. know? And I think that felt really good to like take those learnings, take those lessons, yeah. take a huge step forward in 2017 and then keep making those steps until, you know, I, I'm coming into 2020 definitely where I hope to be as an athlete. Yeah. Um, of yeah. course now it's a bit different. I know. So let's, you know, let's, let's, oh, what's going on? Yeah. Oh, you're back. Okay. Do you want to know what that was? Ooh. Embarrassing story. <laughs> that was my screen time limit, which I'm sure everyone has had <laughs> during the quarantine time. Oh, no. Okay, because you've you been on your... <laughs> yeah. Screen that's, time has gone up. That's awesome. I love it. That's <laughs> hilarious. Kate, stop, stop looking at your afraid. phone. <laughs> All right, going back um, to the Olympic, like it's so cool that you kind of brought up this this whole like literally you've been chasing this dream for for four years and now you're like really in a position where you are the favorite, like just hands down the favorite right now. And uh, you know, I'm sure two months ago you were still like trying to like figure out your training to peak this summer and just you know the the whole schedule is set everything I'm sure from from your food recovery just I'm I'm pretty sure you were like breeding and sleeping only <laughs> thinking about this one thing and then you you wake up one day and you can see that things are starting to shake up and the next day oh the Olympic might be in October and then it might be next summer um like <laughs> run me through all the emotion um, and how you're handling the, the situation right now. Um, how important is your team around you? Just uh, please lay, lay it on the table. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, you know, it was a slow progression at first. You know, the first week we were kind of all waiting to see what was happening. Um, and actually for me, and I know a lot of the athletes I've talked to, that was almost the hardest part yeah. was that week of uncertainty where... Yes you know, you're going about your business and, and you're still doing really hard training and doing intervals and, and thinking that the Olympics are on. 
Uh, but in the back of your mind, every time you're thinking, oh, is this really going to happen? It's, it's seeming less yeah. likely. Um, so I think the uncertainty was really difficult. Uh, but luckily, the IOC, they did a really good job. And I have to give them huge credit for announcing a date quickly. Yeah. Because um, they didn't have to. They didn't have to yeah. finalize the date. They could have kind of, oh, we'll see how it goes. And then, you know, announce next year in a couple weeks. Yeah, um, but I think they did that for the athletes, and I really appreciate that because, for me, uh, you know, it's obviously been a huge season of preparing for this. It was four months of training and being as fit as I've ever been going yeah. into the season, uh, and a lot, a lot of resources, not only in terms of me, but for my team. We've had multiple Red Bull camps. We've done. We had Camp of Champs. We had the Kate Epic. We did all of these things that. Uh, really pushed me beyond where I've ever gone before in training. Yeah. Um, on the one hand, that's exciting. On the other hand, it's a, a bit of a bummer when now we're in a stalling pattern. And I think, you know, the smart athletes right now are dumping fitness. Unfortunately, like you can't stay up here. Oh, yes. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree so 100%. The smart athletes are, are resting yes. or coming down, not, not pushing as hard in training. Yeah. Also because of like, you know, the mental and physical role yes. of stress that we have right now. Uh, but yeah, so find out the Olympics are postponed and we kind of backed off a bit. I took what I like to refer to as a wallowing week. <laughs> I had an agreement with my coach that I got a full week to like do whatever I wanted, yeah. drink some wine, eat some ice cream. I when, I when I get to do whatever I want, I either ride six hours or zero hours. So I had like some six hour rides. I had some zero hour rides. <laughs> <laughs> took a day off. It's like the... To be honest, my training wasn't that different. It just the yeah. mental break of saying this week I'm doing whatever I need to do yeah. to process this yeah. emotion. Like to yeah. process the loss of this goal, the kind of refocus of it. And, and come to a point where I'm ready to go back to work. Yeah. Um, so we had that week. And I said, I will report for work on Monday. Um, <laughs> and on Monday, we like, my new vision board was ready. And we kind of started back, you know, not in the same level of intensity and the same yeah. focus. But at least for me, I think getting back into the routine and saying, yeah, like, we don't have this goal right now. This is a difficult situation. But I, I wake up at the same time. I get on my bike. I do my job every day. Yeah. Um, and that is also like a very centering thing for me in terms of letting this period of time go by to process and then be ready when quarantine lifts and we have a date on the calendar, yeah. be ready to hit training really hard for that next event. Yeah, I think like, you know, as an, as a, an athlete myself, what I find and really, really hard to like wrap my head around like for you guys is, I, don't, I mean, it's hard to, to explain if you really haven't experienced this, but it's a year of giving everything you have. And that year, I, I know for me, like the year I won the CrossFit game, that's exactly what I did for myself. I was like, you know what, I'm going to put every, every, everything I have and hopefully it's going to be enough, which luckily it was. And sometimes it's not, and it's fine. But it's it's just I don't. It's hard to explain how much it is. And I think like when you you you're so okay, the goal is here, and I'm gonna get to rest after. Like I know that's something I would tell myself a lot. Like I can't wait to rest <laughs> because it's so much. But I think it's definitely, I'm sure it's definitely very hard to wrap your head around that you kind of have to start all over again now. Like you're resting yeah. right now, but we start over again as soon as this kind of quarantine is over to like peak again for next year. And uh, I'm, I'm lifting my, my hat to all of you guys out there <laughs> that uh, are going through that because I'm sure right now it's a good time to kind of mourn that situation and be in denial and get frustrated so you can like get your head back on track as soon as you have to. Yeah. And I, I think you make a really great point there. It's, it's not just the physical training. It's really the emotional focus and the mm -hmm. mental focus on that goal. And so I think for me right now, the funny thing is like, you know, I spent six hours in the gym this week. I'll have a 22 hour week on the bike. Like, 
I did mobility. I did yoga. Like I did everything that I Mm -hmm. normally do, but it can't have the same intensity or you can't sustain it. And so for me right now, it's about having that mental perspective that we're, you know, backing, you're, you're not letting go. It's like loosening your grip the tiny amount so that you can go to a hundred percent grip for the eight months leading into the Olympics. Totally. Um, and, and we don't know what that looks like yet. I think yeah. next year, my coach, uh, we're really optimistic about it. Like, I basically get a do-over. So yeah. a lot of the things that worked, exactly the same. Yeah. No problem. I'm going to do the camp of champs. I'm going to do yeah. – we actually – you'll appreciate this. I'll be uh, doing some camps now with the boys. So basically, nice. my coach will drive a car, and I'll stay out for as long as I can, and then I get in the car. Nice. Um, but – you know, doing those camps, like pushing things the way that we have, there's a lot of things we did right. Yeah. Um, and there's also things you can always do better. Totally. So next year, that's that's clear now. Like yeah. I start in November and we race the Olympics in July. That's the mm-hmm. same as it was this year, a do-over. Yeah. Um, I think the thing people are still struggling with and, and me as well is what happens with the rest of this season um, mm-hmm. are we going to race at all in August or is that going to be possible or yeah. are we kind of, you know, no, will there be races on the calendar? Yeah. And, um, I'm wondering cause, uh, so my, I mean, I'm going to brag about my twin right now cause I'm so proud of her, but my, my twin just qualified too for the Olympic in weight, in weightlifting. And, uh, I know for, for me, my first question to her was, so are, do you still have your spot for next year? Because it's like, is the country giving you a spot? Because who knows who's going to be really that, you know, top two or three yeah. next year. So um, I think she she told me that their spot were definitely, it seems to be that in weightlifting, they are definitive. Um, and I'm just asking mm-hmm. you, is it like that with you too? Because I don't know if this it is for well. dependent. It's like that for you too. Yeah. So I think the Olympic Committee overall, they... They, I mean, there's so many athletes that are dealing with this. And yeah. that have run. for example, we had our uh, marathon trials where it's actually a race. The top three people qualify. And, and there's a lot of cases like that where people put a lot of economic mm-hmm. and, you know, mental and physical resources into those spots. It's it's not fair to just say, oh, OK, do. Over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, it's also I, not fair to not give other people an opportunity. Like, yeah. For example, if this had happened in 2016, in 2017, I might have qualified. Yes. You know, so you, you have to give the room for developing athletes. Yeah, it's um, definitely so, tricky. Yeah. It's I think tr- what they said is they're going to make it bigger. They're just going to add more spots, mm, um, which, gotcha. which I really think is fair. Yeah, it's such a tricky situation because it's like, the, the I mean, the goal for the country is not to please the athlete necessarily the goal from the country is to bring medals home so <laughs> you know in the in the grand scheme of thing like the, the goal is for us to bring as many medal back as they can and put the athletes that are going to help them do this and you know when you look at the the flip side for the athletes like you you sacrifice this whole year you're you're peaking in the best shape of your life and you you yeah. earn that spot and it could be taken away from you so I like, I understand both sides and it's, it's rough. It's, yeah, I just, I hope they do just make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, uh, definitely. I think especially in my sport, the mountain bike race at the Olympics is the smallest race we ever do. There's 30 <laughs> women, wow. and the normal World Cup is 80. So well, that, that makes add, sense though. I mean, know, if they add spots or if, you know, people can petition or, they kind of just make it a bit bigger. Yeah, uh, I think that we can make a really fair opportunity for everyone. Where, uh, you know, maybe it is an Olympics where more people get to compete, and I don't think that would be such a terrible thing. <laughs> yeah, more. I I agree with you. I don't think it would. Yeah, especially if the people, you know, should be there. I know. Yeah. I know. For for me competing, um, sometimes the other girl would get injured, and I would hate it because I. I would always want everyone to be there because it's a fair race. So if you win, you win. Like it's not, uh, you know, if the best are, are, are missing, it, it's a little bit of a bummer in my opinion, but that's no, because I, I like things to be fair. Competitor. 
All right, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about, um, I wanted to talk to you about how it had changed for you to the 2016 Kate to the now Kate that is pretty much very consistently finishing first. Um, yeah. <laughs> how how is is the pressure then versus now um the not just the pressure i'm sure that you put on yourself but the the pressure from sponsor the pressure from just so many people involved and how do you deal with that because it can be uplifting for some uh and it can also be very destructive i think absolutely it's a double-edged sword Um, I think last year was kind of my crash course in pressure. I won the world championships in 2018. So went into last season in the rainbow jersey as the world champion yep. um, and went out and won the first two races at the first World Cup. So all of a sudden, I'm the World Cup leader. I'm the I'm, I'm wearing all the jerseys. Yeah. Um, and that was a huge spotlight shift. All of a sudden, I'm the one in all the interviews and, uh, you know, doing signings and and just getting a lot more attention in a way that's really positive for my career, but is often difficult as an athlete who also puts a lot of pressure on myself yeah. um, and, and has really high expectations for my own performance. So yeah. I think that certainly took a little bit of time to get used to. Um, I would say there's there's two main things that help me. The first is just having the right team around you. Yeah. Um, I think for me, I have a really robust big team. And the cool thing about last year was that there were no changes. So mm -hmm. for the last two years, I've worked with the same nutritionist, sports psychologist, strength coach, coach, uh, who else? mechanic. I've, I've had everyone be a part of that team for more than a year. Um, mm -hmm. And that makes a big difference in terms of how well they know you, how you can adjust your plans, you know, what yeah. you've tried. And I think for me, having them kind of in my ear, centering me around, these are my performance goals. This is who I am as mm -hmm. an athlete this is how we respond to success and how we respond to failure. That was really helpful. Yeah. Um, and kind of kept me focused inward instead of externally when it came to setting my goals for the year and, and pushing. Yeah. Um, and then I think the second thing for me was figuring out a way to turn things into fuel. Yeah. Uh, and not necessarily negative attention. I think that mm -hmm. didn't bother me quite so much. I think at the World Cups and at a lot of races I went to last year, it was actually really positive attention um, where, you know, I'm the kind of person I would never want to like leave an autograph session with a little girl not getting yeah. <laughs> like that torture. Oh, okay. Girl, yes. Right. <laughs> yes. I, I, oh yeah. I've been there. It just breaks your heart. <laughs> it breaks my heart. But you also get to a point where you can no longer spend eight hours yes. being available to other people, giving your energy away, saying yes to every single interview. Yes. And for me, um, I had to kind of learn to really appreciate the energy that people were putting into my career and the, you know, people that were cheering for me and wanting my signature. Like, how cool is that? Yeah. That's the coolest thing in the world that people are lined up to get your signature. Like that is a, very rare experience and yeah. it doesn't last that long you know when i'm 40 i don't think i'll be <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> out of my grace signing signatures so yeah um so on the one hand using that as fuel and really appreciating that experience um but also knowing that the best thing that i can do for my fans is to put as much energy as i can into racing my heart out and showing them that i am doing what i love with my whole heart yes and with every opportunity to succeed um, possible. So I think it was kind of, you know, mostly just the way that I think about it mm -hmm. and the way that I kind of process the attention and pressure yeah. um, that made last year a, a really good season for me. Yeah, I think that is, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've been through the same exact thing and uh, that, that's exactly what it is. It's like it had, it's, uh, it's I don't know if it, For I sometimes I feel like when you're you're a woman, so somehow you're you're supposed to be more available than the men. And if a man says they're not available, people will all be like, "Oh, he's just focus on on the game." And if you're a woman, it, it's not really seen really well. But it's really hard that balance of hey, you know, I'm here competing, trying to qualify for world. 
um, I'll stay as long as you want after the competition, but it's really hard to stop between my events because for me, it was always like a lot of events in a row um, because that distraction is, is a lot of emotional energy that I need when I'm going to go do like, you know, a million squats as fast as I can. <laughs> but that balance, I think when, um, when you love people so much and you're so grateful for, for their support, like that to me has always been a battle of like, because if I like it's the sparkle, you get too tied up in the sparkle. Exactly. Exactly. You protect the that's warrior. right. <laughs> that's right. And then you get mad. Like I would, I remember for me, I would get mad at both sides. I would just get mad at both sides because then I would feel guilty for not giving more to the people. But also I would feel mad that I've been put in a situation that I can tell it's, it's hurting my energy for my my competition side so it's i think it's tricky um so yeah. so i'm really happy that you had this <laughs> great support and you figured that out fast because well, it, the team is the team is everything when yeah it comes to that. and i think having people that help protect your emotional energy that's what a real yes. team does is I they agree. they make sure they're you know representing you and and mm -hmm. giving you the opportunity to focus on what you do I agree a hundred percent. And I think um, on the opposite, if you realize that for your team, what they want is something for themselves, where like they, they want you to be out more so they can, you know, get more view for whatever they're sponsoring you and X, Y, and Z, like maybe you need to reassess that team because it really should be someone who, who knows you as a person and can like protect you to become the best you and also understand when is a good time to just, you know, take all of yeah. cam. Like, and I, I've yeah. stayed four or five hours after events to sign up things because the next damn rest day. So I'm fine. There, yeah. But yeah, I totally not, not agree. <laughs> no, <laughs> not before that. That's right. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. All right. Um, a couple more thing I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about your nutrition. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. My Rucha right here. Got to drink some nice. <laughs> well, because I think um, you know, on uh, for for people who follow you on social media, um, we always see you with like your cookie and your your shark gummy and your tacos. And uh, I just want the world to know that I don't think that that is. <laughs> like really um like those are your your um your your fueling thing because you do right that are hours and hours long and you need like a high calorie dense food and carb is a great way to do that because it, it won't like slow down your digestion when you go for for so long so i want you to give a little bit more perspective <laughs> on what <laughs> yeah on what on why you're what your nutrition looks like through a full day and um, why you eat certain things. Because I think a lot of people, because they see you eating cookie and, and gummies, which is what, you know, I would eat like gummies when I'm doing really long stuff too. Um, but most people think that that's just what you eat as a diet. So I want to make sure <laughs> you can run us through your nutrition. Yeah, so I work really closely with the nutritionist on everything. Um, I typically it's it's based on macronutrients for me. So yeah, getting enough protein and fat every day, and then I adjust carbohydrates based on how much I train. Yeah. Um, so in a given day, it's it's based on how many calories I burn in a ride or in a gym workout or add them together. Um, and then I you know make sure to replenish both while I'm riding, but then also. Uh, you know, if I burn 3000 calories in a day, we add a certain number of carbs to that yeah. kind of part of my diet. Uh, of course, if it's a huge workout day like that, I also will go over usually with fat and protein yes. as well. Um, in terms of like the cookies and waffles and all those things, I think for me, it's, it's definitely about giving my body the right fuel for what yeah. I'm doing. And, uh, you know, I've had people comment on things and be like, oh, like if I just eat a cookie, will I be the best ever? And I was like, well, if you ride five hours <laughs> yeah. on your bike, yeah. a cookie. Yeah, then, exactly. Exactly. Which is usually, uh, I typically use um, homemade ride food, like granola yeah. bars, 
fig bars, things like that on my rides. Um, as the intensity goes up, the, the sugar gets simpler. So you use yep, totally. more chews and gummies and gels. Yep. Um, or Red Bull is a good option for caffeine and sugar <laughs> as well. Yeah, we got our hats on. Uh, good plug. But as I'm doing like base training, which I'm, I'm back into now, that's when I'm burning the most calories and doing yeah. those big long rides. Uh, and a great way to motivate yourself is to just pick a bakery that's really far away. I love that. Ride two and a half hours to get there, eat a cookie and ride back. That uh, is so, a great way to do that. <laughs> yeah. I typically take the picture with the cookie, not the like homemade, like granola bars. Yeah. But, uh, but it's all honestly very similar in terms of fuel. Um, yeah. You know, if you eat a muffin or a cookie, those have a lot of carbs in them. And mm -hmm. especially if they're homemade, you can, you know, have it be a fun source of motivation. It's yeah. still something that's a really healthy source of fuel when you are, you know, doing a four or five hour ride that burns five to 700 calories an hour. <laughs> yeah, I think like, it, it, I mean, I've, I've done so many ways of eating because we also have events like at you know, or the CrossFit game is, is like five days of, of working out, including like, you know, maybe a marathon row as like a third or fourth event in a day, which is like just so much. And I think that when you do things that are, are so long and so demanding, like the things that it's really hard to fill up, the especially the carb component with just like rice and potato <laughs> it's yeah. just like you know it, it's just like so so hard and also you don't want anything that you really have to digest so really going for those like sim simpler food that just like get right in your system is in my opinion the best way to go through like mm -hmm. the, those really long ride because let's be honest like Kate when, when even when you do those long rides you are intense it's not just a walk in <laughs> yeah. the park, I'm sure. I'm sure everything you do is always to, with a purpose and to the best of your mm -hmm. ability, but the, the fuel really need to sustain this, so. Yeah, I love that perspective. And I think also the biggest thing that I believe about nutrition is that it's super individual. And so, yes, you know, I you're agree. not looking at generally what has worked in a study. Uh, you're yeah. using studies to test on yourself, a sample size of one. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's been the best way to, you know, continue to adjust. Like if I'm on a big stage race, for example, I've, I love you mentioned like eating a ton of rice, like by day four of a five hour a day stage race, all I can eat is like rice, olive oil, avocado and Parmesan cheese. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. You figure yeah. out what works yeah. for you. And yeah. you adjust with the team around you. So I might yeah. say, this sounds really good to me today, or this sounds really bad to me, or yeah. this made me feel X, Y, Z on the bike. Um, and what works for me might not work for you. What works for you might not work for me. Yeah. But when you use the principles, you'll you'll dial in what fuels yeah. you. I think, I think you're completely right where like, you know, a, an ingredient for you might, you know, for me might make me sick or I might be even allergic to it. But I think for people at home trying to figure out how to uh, fuel their body for a different um, thing, I would suggest to just start with like kind of the research behind it. Just start with like, like for example, for you definitely having a higher carbohydrate intake when you're going for really long seems to be what works best for most people that do what you do. So if I was this newer athlete who wants to, you know, learn how to fuel my body, I think like looking at what has been done with research and what seems to work for most would be a good way to start. And then from there, you can start to tailor it around like those ingredients that works better for you. Or maybe you realize that, well, I'm an athlete that works a lot better on fat. So maybe, you know, you switch on that side. But I think starting with what seems to work best for most uh, seemed to be in my head the best way to attack like nutrition for whatever you're trying to do. Completely. Okay. <laughs> We're in agreement. <laughs> Good. <laughs> See, I'm not training as much and I'm pregnant and I miss 
how much I could eat sometimes. <laughs> oh. Well, you have, you're growing a human, so you also have to fuel that. I know, but it's still less than what I, I could do. So next thing I want to <laughs> talk to you about uh, real quick is I want the world to, show, to see um, how talented you are. So me... <laughs> So, so you are full of surprise, my love. Um, and uh, why don't you show us what you've been doing during this quarantine? Because what we've I talked made, about it. What you've made. I it's amazing. a ball of yarn. A ball of yarn. I turned it to this. <laughs> I'm going to make another one. This is my first. It's like a cute little headband. It's so with a cute. Twist. It's a headband with a twist. It's so cute. This is the first one. I think I have to make my mechanic and I some matching ones. Um, I think so, yeah, too. Desperate, desperate times call for desperate measures. We've all been, I know, around the house a bit more. So this has been one of my little hobbies to do. <laughs> and actually, I'm sure you'll connect with this, Camille. I know you've been doing a little knitting yourself. I did. I have um, it right here. Do you have it? Show, show, yeah. Show the fans. Mine is like a really long project, though. because um, So I'm knitting a blanket for my baby. Which this I know it's, it's very cute. Wait, I'm dropping everything. So this is mine. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's know. a serious. Move. I know, that's a serious project. But I really wanted, I remember I had a blanket that I loved when I was a kid. And I kind of want to do that for my baby. So. Oh, that's I know. the cutest. I'm a big yeah. sensitive person. <laughs> it's actually, though, I, I found, like, for me, it's been really important to find ways to take, an, a, like, a break during this yeah. period because uh, you know everyone's home my, my boyfriend's working from home I'm sure you guys are at home all day yeah. uh, and I actually find it's easier for me to just do a bunch of projects and be running around and and do all my same training and take none of my same recovery yeah. um, <laughs> yes. so, <laughs> yeah. so one of the things that has actually been really good for me is I'll, I'll knit and I'll like put on a show or you know yeah do, that's what do I've been doing too FaceTime with a friend or, you know, kind of do two things at once, which yes. maybe you're not supposed to do. But for me, <laughs> if I just watch TV or I just am on a phone call or I just, I, I yeah. am like a little bit too anxious right now. And yeah. So this has been a good way to like calm me down and I'm keep me busy. I'm a hundred percent like you. Me. For some reason, if I just watch TV, I'm being lazy. Like in my <laughs> head, it's like really hard to. So it's going to just have something in my hand because I'm creating something at least. I'm feeling productive, but it's not like work or something that brings like pressure or anxiety or stress. So yeah, that's been uh, really good for me. And my, my boyfriend used to joke that I'm like the worst at watching TV and movies. I'll like sit down for three minutes and then I like <laughs> yeah. do the laundry, clean the kitchen. I bring stuff into full. Yeah. I'll, like, and then I miss a bunch, and I'm like, "Can you just rewind? I missed it." Oh <laughs> my god! Yeah, you're you're a nightmare to watch a movie with. <laughs> we'll stick to training together. <laughs> or knitting. Now we've got. Yeah. We've got our yes. answer. Done. All right. The last thing uh, I want to ask you, and then if there's anything uh, you want to add to everything, I wanted to ask you um, something that's been on my mind as an athlete more and more as the social media world is evolving and um, I feel like being an athlete used to be kind of you show up you compete <laughs> you get the results and you move on and now it really seems to be a lot more of <sighs> you you know you 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 do all your work at home and now you have to be on Instagram and now you have to be on TikTok and now you have to make YouTube video and you have to create a podcast and you have to do all the all those things on the side and on top of it you have to show up uh, and compete and I don't know if it's something for you um, because to me like just all of that side is is so distracting to uh, become the best me in in like on a competition setting and I also don't know always know how much I really want to do this other stuff um, but I wanted to see like your perspective on this because it's great it's I like I'm very grateful to have such ways to connect with my audience and be able to really have an impact on them which is why I love uh, you know having my my social media and all of that 
but there's really a big flip side of it that sometimes I feel so much pressure to almost have to keep being like creative, keep find, you know, staying on top of the trend and all that stuff. And sometimes I, I kind of just want to disappear a little and do my thing. <laughs> Completely. Yeah, it's it's such a different world now. Um, and I think that's something everyone's kind of trying to figure out as athletes, like, where's your brand? Where's your voice? Mm -hmm. um, I would say for me, especially as a female athlete, I think it's really cool to be able to express your own voice. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think, you know, 20 years ago, if there was a story about a female athlete, they're going through a reporter, like, or, yeah. you know, they're doing an interview, but there just wasn't the same coverage. Yeah. And when there was coverage, it was primarily through other people's, you know, voices, if yes. that makes sense. Like, I agree. You do an interview and they write an article. Uh, now I can post on social media in two seconds and people hear directly from me yes. and they start to follow my journey and understand me as an athlete and a person. Um, so that's, it's really a special thing and something that I enjoy. Uh, but I think it's also something I have to be very thoughtful about, yeah. uh, especially, I mean, a, a good example would be the last few weeks with the Olympics being canceled. Uh, you know, the first day I get a call from, so <laughs> I get a, a lot of calls, you know, yeah. wanting to basically put crying Olympians on the news and do all these interviews. Yes. Yes. I've um, noticed that. Yeah. And I just felt first, I, it was a, a little bit of a raw new thing mm -hmm. that I was processing, but also that it's this global crisis that we're in and it affects so many people yes. in, in much more drastic ways than <laughs> the Olympics being canceled. Yeah. Uh, which is of course in my world, that's a really big thing, mm -hmm. but in the world there's more pressing things. Yes. Um, and so I think as an athlete, you always have a choice of how you engage and yeah. how you express your voice. And in that moment, like I really felt compelled to write and I wrote and I, spent a lot of time, you know, getting my thoughts down at first, just like in kind of a journal format. And yeah. I ended up turning it into that Wall Street Journal piece that got published. It actually like we'd been working on it. And then they officially delayed it. And we were able to publish it that nice. day. Um, and so for me, that's an example of like, as an athlete, instead of trying to like, look at what everyone else is doing, and yes. keep up with them. And you have to listen to like what you what compels you. Yeah. What is a true expression of who you are and a true connection with your, the people that support you or just the community you love? Mm -hmm. For me, it's anyone that rides a bike is in my squad. Yeah. Uh, and I love to be able to connect with them yeah. and, and share this experience and, and learn from each other. And I think there's a lot of ways to do that on social media that come from you. So maybe yes. you do your version of the workout videos, you're doing your version of the live interviews, which is so fun, by the way. Uh, Good. <laughs> and you kind of make yeah. sure as an athlete to do the things that speak to you rather than the things that maybe seem trendy at the moment. Um, and you yeah. can tell when athletes do that. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree more with you. That is one of the, like for me, that was one of the biggest thing in my sport where I like, <laughs> I've done things that I think I'm so funny for <laughs> because <laughs> I think authenticity and wanting to represent yourself the way you want to represent yourself is huge. And when you're in sport, people are, are really looking for um, clickbait and also those like rivalry story and like they'll try to in every way <laughs> they can to make you talk trash about someone else or like make you say something and um and for me, it was always important to talk about like how proud I was for being like a strong woman and that I have like, you know, a, a high degree um, in chemical engineering because I wanted girls to be like, hey, you can, you know, stay in school and do all those things. And uh, so what I started to do in my own interview is <laughs> sometimes they, they would ask me a question and I would answer something just so far away from the question. <laughs> That just had nothing to do. But my goal was I just want to be me and I want to entertain my fan. And I remember um, <laughs> one of my regional, which is a qualification for the CrossFit game. Um, I won this event and they were like, you know, how was the event? And it's like, what, what do you want me to say? Like, of course, I, I'm happy because I just won the event and everyone saw it. So I don't know what to tell you about the event. So I just started to... 
uh, tell them, you know, talk to them about my favorite food, <laughs> and it was just like, That's you know, awesome. yeah, and I just went on, on that. promoting what you are passionate about. Yeah, and I Which would just good. really start to go on, like, things that had nothing to do with, with the question, because I just felt like, to me, that was me, and I could connect with the audience. They hated interviewing me but they couldn't not laugh at it because it was so out there um but i totally agree with you and i i love that that's how you're you're seeing it because i think being authentic and using you yourself on social media and not just trying to be someone else is something that we really really need right now um i think especially on the on the the girl and woman side because it almost seemed like everyone as much as you have access to a variety of person that you can connect to it's such a important time to be authentic and tell people that they don't have to do what everyone else is doing and at the opposite if what you know if dancing on tiktok is your passion do go for it all the way you know like yeah. embrace who you are um but i really love that yeah dancing on tiktok i'm not good I just am not good, you know. <laughs> just, there's no way around it. We've danced together a whole night, <laughs> if you remember. We're gonna work on it <laughs> yeah. for, for you guys. For we you should, guys. yeah. We should try to you make it done. <laughs> when we're allowed back. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Hey, Kate, thank you so much uh, you. for for coming here. Please, uh, right now, I want you to brag about yourself. Where can we, where can we find all your stuff? Where can people follow you? Do you have a website, uh, Instagram? Do you do blog? Is there like, tell me everything yeah, that you're doing. Do all the uh, Instagram, Kate plus fate. And I have a website. It's katecourtney.com. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to see some bike racing soon. Red Bull actually live streams all of our, uh, videos on Red Bull TV. So our racing is live. Cool. And if you want to see what mountain biking looks like, you can look at our races from last year. Um, but hopefully we'll get some new stuff up there for you soon. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining me. And um, you, Kate, stay with me. Thank you, everyone else uh, at home for, for watching. You can uh, follow Kate everywhere. She, she's amazing, as you can tell. And uh, yes, all right. See you guys.